Amen, amen, amen. Well, God is good. I'd like to take a moment and introduce you to our newest member, Calvary Apostolic Church. Everybody say good morning or good afternoon to, to Jackson over there. Isn't it good to have Jackson in the house of God with us? Amen. Praise God. I just long wondered how that was going to be. We could see them holding that little baby. I want, I, I thought about this on our trip. I think of a lot of things about the church while I'm driving. I want a picture as soon as we can get everybody here of Jackson, Matthias, Stormy, uh, TJ, who else that was born in 2022? I want to get a group picture of all of them. That would be, a, that would be something to remember of what God granted to us in this, in this year. God's been so good. Amen. Amen. While you're standing, turn to the book of Ezra chapter 9. And then let me just keep on yakking for a minute because i got so much to say. But if you didn't see it before, Sister Lorinda, those people, whoever you had on your staff making that brittle, that was the best. I'm telling you. People bragged on it. I almost didn't get to eat any between my wife and somebody else in the car. I don't even think we made it back. <laughs> Juju, yes, Juju was in the car. I'm telling you that was, and all of you that just got peanut brittle instead of pecan brittle, I'm so sorry. Pecan brittle was perfect, absolutely perfect. And um, what, what more can I say? It's just everybody that got it just absolutely loved it. And we'd pass it out one or two patties at a time. It, it, um, I could have passed out a whole lot more than that. Amen. Fabulous stuff. Don't you love Calvary Apostolic Church? Yeah. I want to say thank you to Anthony and, and uh, Aaron for taking care of things in our, in our absence. And uh, we promise we will not make a habit of doing this every other month, right? Just <laughs> I think he even lied then. I think he was thinking semi-annually instead of just annual. But uh, it was a unique time. Uh, grandmother rallied. She was looking good. Um, come home. And before we left, Juju chased one cat too many. And he threw out his back, apparently. And uh, he was limping around on, on three legs. And he was getting to better, a little bit better. We did have him x-rayed while we were gone, make sure he didn't have any broke bones or hip out of place. And it wasn't anything like that. But he got back, and he was so excited to be back. He was so happy to be back. And he ran lickety-split over to the church, following me at the church. And... Uh, he made it into the prayer room, and his back gave out. And he laid flat out and wouldn't move and hasn't moved much since then. But we finally have gotten him to respond a little bit. I told the Lord I could not recall of a place in the Bible. It wouldn't bother me if you knew something I didn't know. But I can't recall a place in the Bible where there was precedence for praying for animals. But if somebody can find it, would you please pray the prayer of faith over that dog? About got my wife. He was crying. She was crying. And uh, just pray for our pup. Uh, that's not why my wife's not here. But um, she picked up something on the trip. Amen. I, uh, it's been a while since I filled a pulpit. Usually I get to preach while I'm gone, but because of the schedule, I didn't. But uh, I 
I've got something I want to say. It's first of the year, 2023. What's out before us is up to us. I still believe in Project 120 until it's 220. (laughs) I still believe in that. I want to see God. We almost saw 120 on the 18th. And, um, and, and a lot of us have taken time off since then. But I want to see that changed. I want to see the precious saints of God in the house of God 100% of the time that they possibly can. Someone has said this, and it's absolutely the truth. The more you miss church, the less you miss it. And uh, so... Just think about that this year. But uh, so much I want to say. Pray that the Lord will help me to say it in the course of this message. Ezra chapter 9. I'm carrying you down to verse 13. And I'm going to read just two verses at the time. And we'll revisit this chapter again in a little bit. Ezra chapter 9 verse 13. And after all, this is Ezra praying to the Lord. After all that has come upon us. For our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that thou, our God, hast punished us less than our iniquities deserve. Anybody say amen to that? And it has given us such deliverance as this. Should we again break thy commandments? And join in infinity with the people of these uh, abominations. Wouldest not thou be angry with us till thou hast consumed us. So that there should be no remnant or escaping. I want to preach to you from this title today. When old men pray. When old men pray. And um, got something on my heart that I want to deliver. It's not really a message of heaviness. It's a message of hope. But um, pray that God's anointing would be upon me today. Jesus name. Master. I got to have you. I don't want to do anything through the flesh. I want to do it through the Spirit of the Lord. I want that holy anointing, that quickening of the body and the spirit to rest upon me this this day that I might speak words of edification, words of instruction, words of caution, words, God, that will inspire I pray that you would let us set the tone for the year that is to come. I pray that you would bless Calvary Apostolic Church in 2023. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you and you may be seated. As a young preacher, I oftentimes would marvel when I would sit in a service and listen to one of the seasoned ministers as they would liberally pepper their messages with such rich stories, illustrations, examples, not out of a book but out of personal life experiences. When you recite just an illustration, it's not the same as when you relate personal experiences that you've lived through, you've seen experience taking place at first hand knowledge of things. It just changes the entire dynamics because one has got to live through the story in order to tap into the pathos of it, the passion of it, and to bring life into that. It's only when you do that that it can truly be fully communicated like it really can be communicated. And such was Ezra's prayer In chapter 9, Israel had drifted. 
generation by generation, their godly heritage had slowly been walked away from. The sin of one generation, it was like compounding interest to a bank. And it was upon one generation's sins, the next generation compounded that and did more. It's been said what one generation tolerates, the next generation will embrace. Until finally God had to deal with it. Previously, 10 tribes were taken some 200 years before the, the other two tribes were taken. They were taken into captivity into Assyria. They were called the 10 lost tribes for a reason. Benjamin and Judah, while they held on to godly heritage because much more, many more of the kings of Judah and Benjamin were godly men. And it, 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 it stayed off the judgment of God for about 200 more years. But eventually, even they were taken into captivity into Babylon. Things that happened during that period of time, such as the book of the law being lost in the house of God. How do you lose the word of God? How do you, how do you forget about that book? They should have been able to learn from history. Because if we don't learn to, from history, we are bound to repeat history. They should not have repeated the mistakes of the 10 lost tribes. The reason we call them the lost tribes is because when they carry, were carried into Babylon or into captivity in Assyria, they began to integrate into the society of their captors. They began to wear the clo same clothes that the captors wore. They began to fit in with the society, the customs that their, their other people did, marrying into the families there and bonding with them, picking up their idolatry and their religions until finally you could not tell the difference between the Jew and the Assyrian. For the most part, when the two tribes of Benjamin and Judah were carried away to Babylon because of that illustration, because of that knowledge, these two tribes did much to maintain their nationalistic heritage. They kept their identity as much as they could. For example, they would meet at the Passover, that great feast of deliverance that Israel celebrated. And one thing that they would repeat year after year was, next year in Jerusalem, they never forgot where they came from. And they never forgot that they were meant to dwell in that promised land. And they had every intention to get back to that place where they one time was. I hope that people would feel that way. That they, they, they're going to be back. They're going to do what they ought to do. But in the meantime, many of them did intermarry with the Babylonians. Just as Israel did when they were in Egypt. They brought the mixed multitude home with them. Picking up things. Picking up things that the others had integrating it into their lives, normalizing it, and taking it back to their home. Nehemiah had already returned from Babylon with the blessings of the king. He returned to Jerusalem and he rebuilt the fortified walls around the city of Jerusalem. Many people believe that the book of Ezra is actually a continuation, a sequel, a part of the book of Nehemiah. Many of the Jewish uh, canons actually have the two books as one book, and they see it as one. But the difference was when Ezra returned in part two, when he came in his time to, to the city of Jerusalem, 
His duty was rebuilding the temple, not the walls. The walls were already built, but he was restoring the temple. And the day that the foundation was laid, the day that the rubble was cleared off and they began the work and that foundation was laid again, you talk about a day of celebration because all of Israel celebrated that coming of the temple back to the city of Jerusalem. Ezra chapter 3 says it like this. They sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because he is good. Aren't you glad he doesn't forget us even in our time of judgment? And then they went on and said, For his mercy endureth forever towards Israel. And the Bible said that the people shouted with a great shout. Please don't marvel if you come to a Pentecostal church and we get loud and we get excited because we know where we were. And we know what we have done. And we know that God was merciful to us when we didn't deserve his mercy. But oh, what a great God that we serve. I'm telling you, he's worthy of praise. And so they celebrated because of the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But the next verse goes on and says, Many of the priests and the Levites... And the chief fathers who were ancient men, old men, they had seen the first house. They saw when the foundation was right in its beginning and laid there through all of those years that had been there. They saw that with their own eyes. The Bible said that they wept with a loud voice while many of them around the young people were shouting for joy tears were flowing out of the face of some old men the people could not discern there was that that sound that sound of many waters that we're going to hear when we get to heaven as some of them were shouting but others of them were weeping and crying Because of the depth of what they had lost. All the time, the young men were shouting about what had been accomplished. The old men were weeping because it was gone to begin with when it should not have been lost. I don't know if you're hearing me. One looks to the future. One expects great things in the future. And the other one is looking back and saying, God, we've wasted so many years. And now we've got to redo what we once had. The memories of the high price that had been paid simply because of the sin of their nation making it necessary for the rebuilding from the rubble to begin with. It should have never been torn down in the first place if Israel had lived like they ought to have lived. Listen to me, young apostolics. Listen to me, young generation. There's many lessons that some old men don't want you to have to learn the hard way. We don't want you to have to go through those kind of things. We want to spare you the hardship. We want to spare you the shame that you would have to do to repent of things of your youth. We don't want you to have to live wasted years out there wandering in captivity because of what your sin does to you. Please. Please understand, when an old man is saying something to you, it's not because they don't like you. It's not because they're trying to hold you 
back. It's simply because we want you to be able to build from a better place than having to build out of the rubble. Though we've experienced the long-suffering and the mercy of the Almighty God, there's no reason that you should have to endure the same kind of setbacks. If you can, listen to me, young man, listen to me, young lady. We want you, you can, and you should fulfill your destiny and finish the course unfettered by failure. We don't want you to do that. We don't want to be a, there to be a lost generation, a period of captivity. And so Ezra, Ezra is tasked with the duty of rebuilding. Thank God that God is a God of reconstruction. Thank, I'm glad that he's a God of reconciliation. I'm glad he's a God that can take chaos and bring order to it. He can take darkness and he can bring light. I want you to understand something about God. Everything that God does for you is to build you and to bless you. It was never meant to hurt and destroy. The enemy of your soul is the one that wants to destroy. But God wants to make you live life abundantly. Somebody shout amen. Ezra's job is to walk into that temple that has been built and to begin to teach another generation about the laws of Moses. It's been on my mind. I'm going to put out a post to the ministers of section 3 since my duties include that now. I want the pulpits of this section to understand. It's not at all in about correcting. It's not all about in about showing disapproval. It's about building. It's about strengthening. It's about feeding the flock that God gives us. It's about instructing you in the ways of righteousness so that you can please God and find that harmony in the thing of God. It's helping you to find peace in the midst of the storm. Helping you find out that in the middle of the chaos of this world, there is a God that you can go to that is a comforter and he will help and he will strengthen and he will bless. It's all about bringing you into alignment with the will of God that you may know the perfect will of God, that acceptable will of God. God wants you to know the book. He wants you to know his word. He wants you to fall in love with the things of God. <laughs> Pulpit is not a place for chicken soup of the soul. Pulpit is a place to strengthen, build, educate, inspire, help you, and help you to grow in the things of God. Ezra's duty was also to reestablish the Levitical priesthood, that which had been missing for so many years, to put that order back in place, to give men duty and responsibility to carry out the labor and the work to organize to do all of those things. And then in chapter 8, he proclaims a fast. He had been gone for a while. The book is basically divided into two sections. Verse, chapter 1 through chapter 6. And then from chapter 7 to the end of the book. But he had been gone from Jerusalem for a while. And when he returns... He's a little disturbed about some things. Some things have come to his attention. But he proclaims a fast to remind Israel, we're going to do a day of mourning. Do you all understand what a fast day is? It's a day where you set things aside, not just to ignore food, but to remember everything that you've done that brought you away from God. 
Everything that you have allowed to slip into your life that brought judgment upon you. Fasting is to crucify the flesh. You going to help me preach today? I'm telling you, saints of God, there's some things that we need to go back and remember. We need to remember the pit that God brought us out of. We we need to remember why we got put in the pit. We need to remember the sin that we got brought from. Not with a sense of glee and feeling like we were somebody when we were out there. But oh, thank God, he took a sinner like me. He washed me, he cleansed me, and he put me on a firm foundation. I don't want to glorify sin. I want to glorify the God that brought me out of sin. Hallelujah. So the fast day was to remind ourselves what put us in that condition and then the first place. And then chapter 9. Chapter 9 begins with the princes of Israel coming to Ezra. It's not a tattletale. It's, it's just the fact that there's something he needs to be aware of. Let me, let me just tell you one of the heartaches of the pulpit and the ministry is sometimes the preacher is the last one to know what's going on. It's almost like he's the policeman. We're going to keep it away from him. And that mentality in the kingdom of God, I, I struggle with. I, don't have, I have a hard time with it. It's the code of silence. But that code of silence only works in darkness where things are done that should not be done. You don't go to your doctor and operate in the code of silence. You go to your doctor and you are transparent so that he can help you. So the princes of Israel come to Ezra and they begin to tell Ezra, you know, There are some of the people, and it's even in the Levites and the priests that have not separated themselves from the prior inhabitants of the land. We should have learned our lesson. We should have learned our lesson after we came out of 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. We should have known that we had to get rid of the mixed multitudes back then. We should have known that when we took the land of promise that we had to utterly destroy, run out, every old demon, every old inhabitant of the land. God told them, don't you make some kind of a covenant and agreement with them. Don't you put them under taxation where they serve you and benefit you. That's the compromise spirit of this world that will tell you that you can allow some things because it's going to benefit you somehow. They didn't drive it out, and those are the things that stayed there and hurt them throughout their entire time in the land of Israel. They should have known, they should have known what happened when their brethren were lost to the world because they had intermingled themselves so completely with the world. And now they're coming and telling Ezra, Ezra, I know you're trying to clean things up. I know you're trying to put us back on a firm foundation and a good footing. I know you're trying to give us back our roots, our history, our, in, our, 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 our uh, integrity, our identity. I know you're trying to do all of that. But while you're trying to do that, there's some that are making bonds of the people of this world. That smacks in the face of the doctrine of separation. Hello, somebody. Like Solomon of old, after a while he began to bring in wives from foreign countries, exotic women, And along with those exotic relationships, they brought their curious ways. And he began to study to find out about the things that they believed until finally he was so off base 
that he literally got into occultic things. The wisest man in the world did the most foolish things that he could ever do. Read the book of Ecclesiastes and you read the repentance of a man that said, I sought for these things and I found out it was vanity, vanity, full of vanity. You read of a man that is begging them, serve the creator from the days of your youth. Don't go out searching for other things. If I could plead with this congregation for anything, I would plead with you to love holiness, to love the doctrine of separation, to appreciate the fact that God wants you to live a separate life unto him and to him only. Don't make concordance with sin. Don't play, Don't come to a place of agreement with sin. Don't play and placate sin because sin is going to take you back into the same thing that cursed us to begin with. It brought its idolatry. It brought its conflicting customs because you can't do what they want you to do and the things of the Lord at the same time. How can two walk together except they agree? Dark, what concordance does darkness have with light? We don't, we don't do those things. We are not to be unequally joined together and eventually their immoral sins became normality to Solomon Ezra's response when they come in and they begin to tell Ezra Ezra this is what they're doing the Bible said that Ezra immediately went into a time of mourning when they mourned back then in those days they would take their garments and they would rip their garments. They, the, the biblical term is rent. And, and, and that doesn't mean to loan out. That doesn't mean to get money out of it. That means they tear it. They rent their garments. And they put on sackcloth and ashes. And he went into a time of literally mourning. He sat there. The Bible said he was astonished. I can imagine. Because when you see people do something that they should not do. I know that the wisdom says, young men, don't take it personally when somebody backslides on your watch. But when it's your duty to keep them in the altar, when it's your duty to heal the wounds, when it's your calling to watch over the flock, the pain of that transgression lays upon the, the shoulders of the ministry. No, they tell me not to do it. But when they walk out, many of them will say, it's not you, we love you. But still, I understand what Ezra felt. God, what did I do wrong? How could I have missed this? How can I be so blind that it was going on in my very presence and I wasn't aware of it? The super spiritual ones are going to say, you should have had more spiritual discerning. You should have known. The Holy Ghost should have warned you and talked to you. Let me tell you something. There's people that can be so deceptive And lie. And smile at you the whole time. Pretending I'm doing everything right. And the reality is. There's a secret door. Inside of the soul of their, their life. They've got some things hidden back there in a closet somewhere. They got some things that they do privately that they don't let everybody else see. They've got some things hidden in there. Ezra, the Bible said heaviness came upon him. That means when somebody walked in, you could see it on his on his expression. And some of you have done that to me, Pastor. What's wrong? 
Sometimes I can tell you, sometimes I can't. It's just, you know, what's, what's going on? I, you, you, I can sense your spirit. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Just heaviness that was there. And when you have that kind of a heaviness, let me, exa- let, me, let me admonish you to do the same thing that Ezra did. Because the Bible said the next thing Ezra did is he went to prayer. I said he went to prayer. He went to talking to God. God, there's some situations I'm not proud of. There's some things going on I, I'm, I'm really I'm upset. I'm discouraged about. Brother, Brother Zuniga, get me Ezra chapter 9. Go back there again. Get verse 6. Get verse 6 for me. Bishop, get me verse 8 on, on the heels of that. Get me, get right now, get me chapter 9 and verse 6. Read for me, Brother Anthony. And said, oh my God. He was praying. He said, oh my God. Read it. I am ashamed. I'm ashamed. And blush to lift up my face to thee. I blush to lift up my face to you. Ezra, it's not your fault. You, do, you weren't the one that did it. Tell that to somebody who loves your soul. Tell that to somebody that weeps over you and cares about you, cherishes you. I don't know that I've ever loved a congregation like I love this congregation. You have been such a sweet group of people. And you hear me today. I don't want to lose a single one of you. I worry over these holidays and over this sickness that came late in the month of November that has taken away some of our newly prayed through people. Because I'm, I'm worried that they'll, they'll get accustomed or get upset. God, you didn't answer our prayer. You didn't do what, what we felt like you ought to do. When the truth of the matter is, they need to embrace the cross. And it's only in embracing the cross that the miracle comes. And my heart hurts. I, I worry about them when they're not in the house of God. I, and, and when something happens that I'm totally unaware of, when I find out that there's been pros- uh, promiscuous activity or there's been some other sin that is blatant and shameful I feel like Ezra God I'm embarrassed sorry read Anthony my God for our iniquities are increased over our head for our iniquities Watch the the language of the Word of God is not incidental. It's not just accidental, folks. When he used that term, he used it as saying it's our transgressions. It's I participate in this. It's it's as much my fault as it is. No, no, it's not your fault. Tell that to a parent that has lost a child, that has walked out on the truth and is living out there. And the guilt and the condemnation that they feel because they, they question themselves, what could I have done different? What could I have done to keep them in the church? Should I have loved them more? Should I have given them more prayer time? Should I have taken them to more rallies? What should I have done? God, where did I go wrong? Read on. And our trespass is growing up unto the heavens. Trespass is growing up into the heavens. Ezra was so distraught. The next thing he does, give it to the elder. You ready, elder? Verse 8. Next thing he does is he begins to acknowledge the sins of the past. Watch this. Verse 8. And now for a little space. And now for a little space. Grace hath been showed from thee. Now for a little space. Grace has been shown. God, you brought us out of the mistakes where we were. We, we went into 70 years of captivity. You brought us out. You brought us back home. We built the walls. We built the temple. We shouted and rejoiced. It was such a happy time. You gave us a space of reviving. Read. From the Lord our God. Read. To leave us as a remnant to escape. He gave us a remnant to escape. It's not the crowd that went out. It's not as many as left. But God, we've still got a remnant. And out of a remnant, you can rebuild. Read on. 
and to give us a nail in his holy place. And to give us a nail in his holy place. That means a secure place. It means the, something to hold on to, read on. That our God may lighten our eyes. That you might lighten our eyes. And give us a little reviving. And give us the richness of the language. A little reviving in our bondage. bondage. God, we suffered through all of that. And then it was like a breath of fresh air. It was, it was we hung our harps on the willow. They did. And we were in, in, in captivity. Right, right. But oh, when we came out with deliverance. We felt like shouting when we came out of the wilderness. When we went, when we came back home, you talk about rejoicing. The rose bloomed again. Life was there again. It was a great thing to get back in the land of promise one more time. God, this is what you've given us. You've given us a space. I'm going to tell you something, Calvary Apostolic Church. I, I don't. I can't tell you about any mistakes in the past, but I'm going to tell you 2020 has been an absolute great year. God has been so good to us, uh, letting us see people come back, uh, letting us see a backsliders praying back through, and I'm not finished with it yet. Uh, I want to see more. I want to see more. Acknowledge the sins of the past, but it's not just the sins of the past. It's not just yesterday's mistakes. Right. You hear me. God's forgiven yesterday's mistakes. Right. We've dealt with yesterday's mistakes. That's under the blood. What we've got to deal with is today's. I'm not preaching to you to put guilt and condemnation on you about what you did back then. What you did back then is over with. It's gone. It's under the blood. But what I'm more concerned about is where we're at right now and today because we've come too far to lose out now. We've, we've seen too much advance in order to lose out. With... Read verse 10 for me. And now, O oh our God. And now, O oh our God. Read. What shall we say? What shall we say? After this. Read. For we have forsaken thy commandments. For we have forsaken thy commandments. You've been so good to us, God. You've brought us a mighty long way. And now we have forsaken. You cannot repent. If you cannot repent... If you cannot repent, you will never find true deliverance. I believe that. I believe that with all of my heart. Oh God, I'm so sorry. Forgive me, Lord. My wife told the story. She wasn't raised in apost as an apostolic young lady. She didn't know until she was finally got in church that her grandparents were were. A, were come out of an independent Pentecostal church. She didn't know that. Her grandmother and grandfather loved God and lived for God all their, their lives, but she wasn't aware of that because of a backslidden parent. But when she, when she, she talked about her heart being stirred as a young girl and that she would go across the street to the, to the Baptist church that was over there, and there was one simple boy that lived in the community. He was pretty well known uh, for, for his... Um, innocent ways. Is that polite enough? And so she would tell the story that when that church had revival, their annual revival or whatever it was, series of services, and, and at the end of those services, the preacher would get up there and invite people to walk down and to shake the preacher's hand and sign the fellowship card and be saved. Aren't you glad you're an apostolic? She said, Doug, in his simplicity, year after year, would weep, stand up, make his way down the aisle, get down to the altar, pull those cigarettes out of his pocket, and he'd put his cigarettes on the altar, and he'd weep and cry. Preachers over there trying to tell him, Doug, 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 you don't have to do this. You did this last year. But Doug knew. While all, a bunch of the rest of the men would go out in front of the sanctuary and smoke their cancerettes. Doug knew in his little innocent heart 
that what he had been doing was wrong. And he'd walk to that altar and no one would preach it to him, but he'd lay him down. The only problem was when he got finished preaching, he picked him back up. That's not repentance. That's, that may be sorrow, and that may be guiltiness, and that may be a lot of things. But when we're talking about real repentance, we're talking about you walk away from it. We're talking about you leave it behind. You don't go back to the same things that you used to do, but you leave it back there. And you say, God, I'm, I'm embarrassed about it. I'm sorry I did it, but I'm not going to do it again. I'm going to quit and I'm going to begin to live a brand new life. I know it's January the 1st, 2023. And I know there's a lot of people that made a bunch of commitments uh, to begin today. But I want to tell you uh, that a New Year's resolution isn't going to be sufficient. It's going to have to be a change of heart. It's going to have to be the grace of God. Uh, it's going to have to be by His mercy uh, and by his divine help. It's going to be because genuine repentance makes you change. But Anthony, start reading for me in verse 11. Read alert verses 11 and 12. Read. Which thou hast commanded by the servants thy prophets. You saying, commanded by the servants your prophets. We've already heard this preach. It's been delivered to us for years. Read. The land unto which ye go to possess it Read. is an unclean land. It's an unclean land. With the, with the filthiness. Jesus told us, I'm putting you out there, and you're going to be like sheep among wolves. He told us you're going to be persecuted. You ought to understand in the beginning, he's not offering you a life of, of no temptation and no trouble. It's not some paradise and some uh, uh, nirvana where you're not going to suffer anything. No, it's an unclean land because, because it's been taken over by the things of this world. Uh, uh, I, Adam, back in the beginning, he had dominion. That Adam and Eve surrendered dominion to the adversary. And it's our job to walk into a midst of an unclean world and to take it back. Read. With the filthiness of the people of the land. Read. With their abominations. With their abominations. Which have filled it from one end to another. Filled it from one end to another. With their uncleanness. You can't go to the mall anymore, young men, without seeing more than you need to see. You can't, you can't, we can't serve. At, at Raisin Day, without seeing way too much. We live in an unclean world. We live in a world that we worry about our kids when they go to school, that there's going to be some school counselor that is going to help them transition and tell them that they're of some other gender. That's an ungodly world that we live in. Somebody has got to clean it up and put it into their hearts that we're going to love God. Read, son. Now, therefore, now therefore, give not your daughters unto their sons. Give what? Give not. Give thy daughters to their sons. Give not. Give what? Not. No flirt to convert. Young ladies, I, it bothers me. I really do. I want more young men in, this, in the church that, you can, that are marriageable, and, and I want them to love God, not be a bunch of jerks. I'm, I'm telling you the honest truth. I, I, I am concerned about it. As a pastor, I pray over that because I want there to be a godly seed, a godly heritage where you raise your children in the fear of God just like you're being raised in the fear of God. I want that. But you hear me. Just because you have been raised innocent, there's a beauty to it. There's a cleanliness to it. And there's young men out there in the world that would love nothing more than to destroy that purity and that innocence and to, to, to violate you and to destroy you. They'd love to flirt with you and bring you out. You're not going to change them. You're going to be affected by them. Hey, apostolic church, are you going to help me preach? I'm telling you the burden of my heart. We've got to make sure that our precious families are not unequally yoked with the love of this world. 
Read. Neither take their daughters unto your sons. And don't swap it out. Don't, don't men, young men, there's too many godly women. Don't go out there and find some harlot. Jezebel would not have had the influence in Israel if Ahab would have had the strength of character that he should have had. You don't want our young girls putting on makeup and looking like the world? Then men, quit looking at women like that. All right, read on. I'm in trouble. Read. Nor seek their peace seek or their, their wealth. Don't wait, wait, wait. Now, I know I understand the marriage part, <laughs> but we got to get along, you know. <laughs> so we got to we got to go along in order to get along. I I, I don't drink, but I just go with them. I, I don't agree. I know they're doing some things wrong, but I'm not going to rat them out. You don't want me preaching in this place. I've been two weeks without a pulpit, and i got some stuff stored up. And you hear me. You hear me. Don't you wink at sin. Don't you paticate with it. Don't you platicate it. Don't you make it feel like I'm okay with what you're doing. There ought to be somebody in this society that will stand up. I know it's not PC. I know that this world is doing their best uh, to shut the message up. Uh, but somebody still got to get out there and preach uh, that there is a right way uh, and there's a wrong way. Uh, there's the holy and there's the profane. Uh, and I have decided... I'm going to live for Jesus. Don't go after their, their peace, peace or their wealth. And don't go after their money because this, the money of this world is going to fail you. You got any money? You got any change in your pocket? You got any change in your pocket? You got any change? How come? We used to carry change in our pocket all the time. One of the reasons I don't is because too many times I was tempted to sit in the pulpit and rattle it in my pocket. <laughs> but I don't use cash that often anymore because I use a piece of plastic. And besides that, during the pandemic, our fast food restaurants said there was a shortage on coins. And so if you gave them a dollar, you didn't get any change back. And let me tell you something. There's no shortage of metals in the United States. And if they can print dollar bills, they can print pennies. You know why they're doing it? It's because they're pushing an agenda. They're trying to move us little by little towards a one world financial system. They are moving us in that direction. Oh, pastor, you're just, you no, I'm telling you the absolute truth. We are living it in our generation. They're trying to move us. They're, they're already making it acceptable in other countries and moving it into this country that you get a chip so that you don't have to worry about all those things anymore. It's going to be for your convenience and it's going to be for your safety until they shut your account down because you're a child of God and they decide to put you in prison to keep you because they can do it. I'm telling you it's going to come. There's got to have to be a people of God that, that trust him. Brother Bodie, I don't know if we can handle it. If God brings us to it, he'll bring us through it. The Holy Ghost that is going to take us into the rapture, whatever we have to face, I'm telling you, God is more than enough to take care of us in this present world. Is my clock still wound up or? Read. That ye may be strong. That you may be strong. And eat the good of the land. Eat the good of the land. I want the blessings of God. I want, I want the promises of God. They are yea and they are amen. They don't belong to the world. They belong to me. They're the traitors. They're the ones that don't belong here. We're the ones that ought to be inhabiting the land. I'm not, I'm not talking about a piece of real estate. 
I'm talking about this godly experience we've got. Read on for me. And leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. I love your parents because they have left such an indelible mark upon Calvary Apostolic Church. And that ought to be the way every family is. Somehow, somehow our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren are living for God. Read on for me. And after all that has come upon us. Now to my text. This is what we want. We want to see our inheritance go from generation to generation. Promise of Pentecost. And then to my text, verse 13. And after all of this has come upon us. Read. For our evil deeds. For our evil deeds. You did this to us because of our mistakes. Read on. And for our great trespass. And for our trespasses. Read on. Seeing that thou art God, has punished us less than our iniquities deserve. You have punished us? Right, right. So yeah. less than our iniquities deserve. Right. I remember, I remember an evangelist. I may have him come before too long. A dear friend of mine named Jason Beardsley. Jason was preaching revival in Florida, and I met him. He had preached for me in in another state, but I met him down there in Florida. We were sharing stories from both of us weren't pastoring at the time. And he's sitting there and he's got a heart of compassion. And he said, Brother Bodie, in all sincerity, he said, Brother Bodie, I'm going to pray God gives you what you deserve. And in a moment of humility, I said, please don't do that. <laughs> don't pray I get what I deserve. Pray that I get his mercy because he's already been better to me than I deserve. Can I hear an amen out of anybody? God has been a good God. Read on for me. And has given us such deliverance. You've given us such deliverance. As this. We've, we've, we've come out of captivity. We've seen reviving. Read on for me. Should we again break thy commandments? Are we going to again break our commandments? Are we going to fall in the same groove that we used to do? Are we going to go back to the same habits, the same things? You see, if you don't change your environment and you don't change your friend set, you're going to keep doing what you've always been doing. Right. Right. They said, show me your five close friends and I'll show you who you're going to be. Because you're going to be who you hang out with. Read on for me. And join in affinity with the people of these abominations. Are we going to join in infinity with people of these abominations? Are we going to take up the things of this world? Read on. What is not thou be angry with us? Won't you be angry with us? Till thou hast Do you think God us. would be angry with us? We go back to that kind of garbage the same pit that he dug us out of, pig to its slop, dog to its vomit. We don't want to go back there. He brought us out from there. Read on. So that there should be no remnant nor escape. Because if we're doing that, this church is doomed. Read the next verse. O Lord God of Israel. O Lord God of Israel. Read. Thou art righteous. You're righteous. Read. For we remain yet escaped. We're escaped. We got it, out. We've got deliverance. Read on. As it is in this day. Read. Behold, we are before thee in our trespasses. Read. For we cannot stand before thee because of this. God, we made some mistakes. We, we, we're almost back to where we did some things again. I'm preaching to some of you in the Holy Ghost. I'm preaching to you about closed doors, hidden sins. The power of deliverance has been obvious. Don't go back to where you used to be. God's been good to us in 2022. 
I have rejoiced. We've seen tremendous advances in the kingdom. And I'd be so severely disappointed if we would lose our revived direction all because of some unrepented sins. Young people hear me. Lack of separation. Flirting with this present world. When all the time God has given us a little space of grace. I've tasted it and I want to see it again. I want to see people praying through. I like the backdrop behind me, but I'd like to see it move more often. I want to see the waters of baptism stirred again and again. We need to retake our land. Devil, Daddy, you need to start praying this over your home. Devil, this is not your house. My kids belong to God. I dedicated them to God, and they are not yours. And we're going to have revival in our home. Let me, let me tell you what I see for 2023. That rhymed. Let me tell you what I see for 2023. I see a year of deliverance. Now, I've preached the precaution, and I've preached the concern, but I'm going to tell you it's because God has given us a space of grace, and God is moving us in the right direction, and I don't want to see that momentum lost. I believe that this year is going to be a year of deliverance, that people are going to get set free in 2023. They're going to get set, set free from bondage. They're going to get set free from habits. They're going to get set free from the enemy trying to keep them knocked down. Some homes are going to get the, that old burden of infirmity off your house. God's going to lift that, take it away. God's going God's to open up revelation and understanding. And God's going to turn around and begin to pour out windows of, from heaven. He's going to start pouring out the blessings he promised. That's what I see for 2023. So I'm going to proclaim this year a year of deliverance. A year of revival. And a year of us pursuing the things of God with everything that we have. Would you stand with me right now? Hallelujah. Lift your hands and start praying for deliverance. Lift your hands and start praying for deliverance. Start praying for freedom for people that have been bound. Start praying that God would open up the blinded eyes. Come on, come on, pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray in the Holy Ghost. I believe God's about to do some marvelous things in the house of God. If there's anybody in this house that is tired of the bondage of the shame of sin, I want to tell you there's deliverance in the house today. The power of, of deliverance is in this place. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Come on and pray. Let's worship the Lord. Why don't you get out of the pew and fill the altar area? Jesus. Jesus. No more shackles, no 